I know we have colleagues from the uh, Americas and also we have a colleague, Emmy, from one uh, well, number of colleagues from uh, Tokyo joining us. So we have a wide span of time zones. Hopefully we'll all be on the same one by the end of the same uh, thinking on the end of the, the session. Uh, my name is Steve Godfrey and I'm on behalf of GAIN and FAO. Welcome to this third virtual round table. In a minute I will ask uh, Marcella uh, from uh, FAO to do a summary of yesterday's discussions which was pretty lively. The chat box was full. Um, but I wanted just to maybe take two minutes to take you through some of the housekeeping so that this uh, webinar works as efficiently as yesterday and the day before. So on the simultaneous interpretation, translation, this is available in Spanish and French. I think you, those of you um, uh, who are here on previous days know that you can choose that in the interpretation button below. Um, to listen in, in English, select the off button. Um, that will mean you don't hear uh, more than one language at the same time. And if you make an intervention in Spanish or French, you would um, need to turn interpretation off by selecting off in the interpretation menu. And please, uh, to avoid getting the sounds mixed up, make sure you use original audio option, sorry, that, that is muted, so you can hear a clean interpreting feed um, just with the language uh, you're listening to without the original in the background. And I think, uh, Candela will now post these instructions into the chat box in case you need to refer to them. Um, secondly, just the broader uh, housekeeping rules for the session. I think you're aware of most of these. They're standard. Please make sure you're muted uh, and turn your video off. This helps everyone get smooth access. You're um, welcome, of course, to unmute yourself and put your video on when you're speaking or are given the floor. Um, during the Q&A session, you'll have an opportunity to pose a question to the speakers and you should do this by putting into the chat and the moderator will be reading those questions and will either summarize them or will um, invite you to speak. There are uh, the three discussion papers that have been sent to you, um, uh, which uh, they will be published together with a policy brief in the uh, aftermath of the surround tables. And uh, Marcella has kindly summarized for us the results of discussions on day one and day two. These will also, these summaries prior to the finalization of the document from the whole um, uh, webinar series, these will be made available shortly after the, um, the session so you have an immediate feedback. Um, I think really with those um, short introductions, I will ask you, Marcella, to take us through your recap of the uh, discussions yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Steve. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to the third day of the FAO GAIN virtual roundtables, everyone around the table, private sector on healthy diets. I, I have heard from many of you that the discussions up to now have been very inspiring and useful, and I couldn't agree more with you. And I think this is the beauty of partnership. All these roundtables have been set up as part of the partnership uh, that we have uh, between FAO and GAIN. So uh, this is producing new thinking, new ways forward. Again, beauty of partnership and GAIN is a fantastic partner. So the discussion is yesterday on strengthening national policymaking for healthier diets. How can business and government work better together? Focus on the pivotal question on the role of governments. We examined the scope and the character of this. We also surfaced new thinking, we think, about the roles of what were identified as key actors in this debate. Parliamentarians, youth, women, farmers, and consumers, of course. The debates uh, were very lively, and as Steve has said, the chat box was really full. We heard very interesting case studies from Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Oman, and Vietnam showing the range of efforts being made to shape national policies, to support healthier diets, to support the linkages between health, education, and agriculture, and of course, to support SMEs in this endeavor. We discussed three aspects of the role of government in its broader sense, the executive as well as departments, parliamentarians. We asked ourselves, are national plans necessary? First, Achieving healthier diets 
involves many branches of government, trade, health, finance, food safety, agriculture, and aligning these policies is necessary. National food systems action plans are a new idea. And to our knowledge, only Norway has developed one. But with many policies and actors impinging on food systems, it's hard to see how we can change diets without clear national goals, clear metrics, and a plan to rally behind. But national action plans need also to take into consideration the le regional level, the local level, and of course, very importantly, and that was discussed amply uh, yesterday, the knowledge emana emanating from traditional and indigenous food systems. Second, given the sheer numbers, variety, and character of the farmers, micro and SMEs, only government can create the enabling environment to allow the private sector, from the micro to the small to the medium to the large, to be able to deliver. We know that this is not a quick fix. Consumption is not primarily driven by health, uh, but includes a host of other powerful drivers. So massive efforts to accelerate behavior change are needed. This involves demand-side standards, such as Chile is doing on their famous labeling uh, law initiative, which is providing information so that consumers can make healthier changes, choices. It also needs supply side interventions, notably around making finance more available, bankerizing SMEs, if you want, and farmers, and simplifying regulatory mechanisms. This, of course, raises the issue of risk and who is going to bear the costs, and certainly it should not be the SMEs and farmers. It is important to think about how to help SMEs grow and aim to improve the efficiency of value chains so that we both improve the quality and lower the prices of healthy foods. We discussed uh, quite extensively on affordability. With improved efficiency, we can increase incomes of producers and value chain actors. It is not a zero sum game of price versus livelihoods. Third, in evolving new policies, how we bring businesses to the policy debates is still a hot topic. We need to address conflicts of interest, and this cannot be overlooked, but equally address the needs to be inclusive by consult consulting. If you don't consult the key players in the food system, the danger is, of course, that policy won't have traction and work for the people you're trying to support. We saw quite a bit of nuance in the debates yesterday to encourage us to be thoughtful and not be binary about who's at the table. For example, distinguishing between consultation, open and inclusive, and decision-making, which in the end, it's the job of the government. And rethinking also what we mean by PPPs. So should we not consider instead of PPPs and all the work that's behind the actual partnering, uh, should we not consider PPEs and uh, use the term engagement rather than actual uh, partnering to be able to be more inclusive uh, and to bring in more um, of the SMEs? We need to ensure that the SMEs have the capacities to participate in a meaningful way in consultations, and this may involve, of course, strengthening their organizations and a series of other um, needs of capacity development for SMEs were also uh, discussed throughout these uh, two days. There was also a lot of emphasis on the question of data matrix and how that links to the policy process. In Chile, for example, they're using the evidence to shift perceptions around the labeling law to change the attitude of the stakeholders. And uh, that law has also created an effective incentive for the private sector to produce healthier products. At a macro level, we face bigger challenges in answering how we can measure the adequacy of the, of the food system against the goals of healthier diets. FAO's experience under the first program is that the evidence of the true costs of food, the trade-offs and the real costs of a healthy diet and a healthy planet are not really available. We don't have a system that can measure food systems against healthy diets. Lawrence described the need for 
better tools to help governments to understand these trade-offs. Trade and we believe that addressing this gap is a major priority. Finally, we ended the day with a call to think more openly and engage youth, of course youth, but not as the future and the future leaders, but as the present ones, as they are already leading change in thinking about diet and the planet. And they have a major role to play in creating demand for healthier diets. It reminds us again that to achieve the goals this webinar has been discussing, we actually would need to have a huge table to be able to bring in everybody who should be here uh, to, be, uh, to participate in the debates. Today's discussions will focus on conclusions and on the way forward. And we aim, aim together with you to identify recommendations to scale up actions and commitments for this agenda. Thank you for your attention and over to you, Steve. Uh, yesterday. Uh, yeah, sorry, it was a great summary of yesterday's um, discussions. When we, um, when we developed this three-day webinar um, between uh, FAO and GAIN, we thought it would be helpful to have a consistent process of dialogue through the three days. But we also thought that we should have somebody who could give us, a, a, from a high level, an independent perspective on this topic. And um, it wasn't very difficult to um, really invite Patrick Webb to do that for us. I think Patrick's really one of the most influential kind of players or voices in the area of international nutrition, not just you know, nutrition, but the wider issues of food security, ag, nutrition policies and the areas that are increasingly coming to the center when we think about food systems in a in a wider context. Now I knew all that Patrick but I didn't know that you were from Somerset in England yeah. which is actually pronounced I think Somerset is that correct and uh, you are. it's famous for certain kinds of foods and drinks you might get cheese into your presentation you may yeah. find it with this audience a bit more difficult to get cider in but anyway we're very very pleased you've given us this time to join us today and I'd like now to pass over the word to you to give us your perspective on the topic we're, we're discussing. Patrick. Thank you Steve and uh, Marcella. Yeah, um, I don't think the translation function allows for Somerset accent to, to kick in so I won't go too far into that. Uh, we'll, we'll stick to normal uh, English. I'm going to share my screen. Um, somebody else has to stop sharing theirs. I have just a few slides just that, to um, kick off uh, kick off uh, some, some thinking and hopefully promote some discussion around this area. So can you see my screen? My, uh... Yeah, that's good. You see the, the front screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, thank you, everyone. I thought that was a great summary of the previous two days. It does sound uh, exciting, actually, um, that a lot of things are focused more on progress and agreement than challenges and um, disagreements. Obviously, there are still going to be areas uh, where we have to work on. Uh, I do think those that were hi highlighted there by uh, Marcella are, um, are important ones that need to be prioritized. So I'm literally just in a few minutes just going to give some very high order um, thoughts to kick off this day in this important um, particular agenda. So I am coming at this from the business angle. Uh, the recent report from Chatham House on the business case for investment in nutrition. And there's some pretty straightforward statements about the importance of business to improving nutrition or healthy diets or even uh, food systems and vice versa, the importance that healthy diets and nutrition have for businesses. Now, those kind of statements are fairly straightforward. Uh, it's good that they're being made uh, with increased urgency in the business domain World Economic Forum and others. The challenge, of course, is pushing those into actionable uh, both commitments and investments. And 
since I was asked to talk about challenges and, and opportunities, I'm going to just literally kick, you know, kick off our discussion with a, th with a few uh, on both sides. And I see ongoing challenges uh, relating to uh, coherence. I think this, we still are struggling when talking about not just healthy diets, but food systems as a whole and trying to shift food systems to be generative of or supportive of healthy diets. I think one of the immediate things that comes up is incoherence or pinch points or inherent contradictions in policy portfolios at the, at the national level of governments, um, which mean competing agendas, competing goals, uh, sometimes competing institutional mandates. And those in the areas of incoherence arguably are a fundamental hindrance to progress and need to be identified early on. It's not just about what new policies have to be enacted, what new investments need to be made. A better understanding of the inbuilt constraints in a policy portfolio or strategy is very, very important going forward, especially as it relates to the outcomes on which businesses of all kinds need to be uh, playing an important role. Part of that, my second point is, is the invisibility or the hidden nature of the small business, small and micro enterprise roles across the food system uh, as undeniably important players in facilitating food system functions, but which are poorly integrated into the dialogue, poorly understood as um, winners and or losers of various policy instruments. And their uh, presence at the table is uh, pretty limited. You put those two together and you have, I think we, we would all agree in most countries, a somewhat of a government reluctance to take active, proactive roles in shaping food systems. Uh, it's one thing to make national commitments to SDGs, but it's another thing altogether to be seen to engage in the governance of food systems, which uh, several people have pointed out. Governments are not shy of governing food, uh, water systems or power systems or infrastructure systems, but food systems are a bit of an, an outlier in most places. And yet this is one of the most fundamental uh, areas for development. So some of those uh, challenges, just a couple of slides. This is um, just a highlighting the, the really important role in Africa. This is just the fruits and vegetables value change, small and medium, uh, enterprises matter, but so do micro producers, the very small producers who are involved in production and processing, but the SMEs play this huge role from production through processing and marketing and then through retail, a um, uh, role which dwarfs the very large pro, uh, producers, farmers, and the very large companies. Um, of, of course, growing role of modern retail at the supermarket, um, but the point really trying to make here is that we, we've got to shed more light on the vitality and the functions and the roles of these small players in business and how, what exactly do they need to function better? And one of the reasons that's so important is of course the impact of shocks and uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic is just the latest uh, of those and Gain did a, a very nice survey just recently of um, many, many different firms in many countries trying to understand both short-term and long-term implications. And it's not that surprising that you'd see uh, um, firms reporting that they expect shortages of supplies and transportation disruption due to a shock like this, the pandemic. Those can be fixed in relatively short order, but some of the other issues like well, we're gonna shift our long-term long uh, focus of production, or we're literally gonna close down, we're going bankrupt, or, and the production is going to end. Those are longer-term implications of the impact for the small and medium-sized uh, firm sector. And our governments and our donors, their development partners, uh, really attuned to this facet of building back better, 
in the context of crises? And what does it take? How do you identify the need and make sure you have the right investments? The opportunity side, uh, I think there are many. I'm heartened to see the role, the very positive role of, of business in discussions on the nexus of food systems as they link to climate change, pandemics, income inequality, as well as healthy diets. Right? So uh, what was a hard sell just a number of years ago uh, no longer is, and, and firms of all sizes are very keen to better understand the multi-directional nature of links between food systems and dietary choices and the, the impacts and the relationships with climate uh, pandemics and, uh, and human health, of course. There's a lot of business engagement, particularly in the sphere of sustainability and emissions reductions. We're, we're seeing quite a lot of concreteness there. Um, where one would argue would like to see the same level of, of engagement and innovation is um, matching attention to planetary health to human health. I think that's where healthy diets um, come in. I do see a huge focus growing, uh, and, and, it's, and it's important that it, that it grow. Uh, most discussions on food system transformation these days with the healthy diet or climate, climate uh, agenda, big focus on how that ties to the jobs agenda, which brings in youth, the human health agenda and the climate agenda all together. Right? So there's, there's the idea of, of multiple wins, um, uh, not a zero sum game is quite important and that's, that's growing. We have a, a latest report from the World Economic Forum for just an, an example, pointing out that you know, they, they argue for 15 entry points into food systems. And their focus is business opportunity worth $10 trillion and creating up to 400 million jobs, right? The back of the envelope calculations. Um, but they're starting from the point that the global food system, which includes land and water use and all the supply chains represent about 40% of global employment. And that can grow by careful allocation of new technologies, innovations and practices in, in a range of areas. So in, in a forward looking sense, this is, uh, this is an argument for much greater business engagement in facilitating food system transition for healthy diets that can generate hundreds of millions of jobs. So the link there with business is obvious. Back to the Chatham House report, it's a partly the other way around. The case there was being made that with poor nutrition linked to poor diets, uh, businesses themselves around the world, they looked at uh, nine, 13 business sectors in 19 countries, businesses are losing billions of dollars billions of dollars a year due to impaired work productivity, be it labor or cognitive, uh, as a result of underweight and uh, obesity and related um, disease conditions. So that is their main argument that the, the productivity losses in businesses are not well understood, but there is a huge potential for businesses to tackle those problems through canteen jobs-based uh, programs and, and other, other ways of, of addressing these issues. Um, but it's it points to, and there, the conclusion of this. Entonces, la conclusión de todo esto. Sí, uh, last slide that they're, they want the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Es que quieren el... They want the Nutrition Summit to be committed, um, clear commitments to, Tenga compromisos uh, claros. So the healthy diets matter for business. Business matters for healthy diets. I think that's a truism. Everyone is focused on level playing fields for knowledge, data, funding, access, common goals. All of this means focus on clear principles of engagement with clear targets and clear measurement and clear responsibility on both sides with what came up earlier a greater attention to the costs and benefits and how those are accrue across the food system players as we enter into a process of, of transformation. So I'll stop there. A lot of overall issues that seem to be resonating in recent reports, recent discussions, they all point 
So the, the desire for greater engagement, greater principles for engagement, and the greater trust and collaboration that will derive from those. Thanks. Patrick, uh, thank you so much. I think that really was, um, you know, I think in the last two days, we focused a lot on the, these issues of invisibility and the question which you've put in quite sharp relief of, of government's reluctance to interfere or get engaged in what people eat as, a, as a, an issue. But I think what came through to me is that, you know, a very strong case that the analytical kind of framework, the way in which these problems are discussed, the evidence around them, and the understanding of the dynamics, that unless we can get a clearer picture of that, it will be very hard to shift the political uh, needle and get more um, uh, coordinated action led by government around the goals that we've talked about. So I think that was extremely helpful. I know you're going to be, I think, joining us again later to yes. offer some reflection, but thank you on behalf of everyone for a, a really, a really great presentation. I'm now going to pass to um, Lawrence, who will be leading the panel, um, the first panel of the day. Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Marcella, for a great recap and introduction to the day. Thank you, Patrick, for a really nice, um, really nice reflection on where we are uh, and where we need to go and, and with some ideas about how to get there. Um, we're really great, to, and Steve, thank you for your nice uh, facilitation. This, this session, we've got an exciting panel for you now. Um, this panel is about, it's kind of looking forward, it's saying what are the commitment areas that we really want to see developed and, and, and nailed down for the, uh, as we get ready for the summits uh, of next year, whether they're the food summit, the nutrition summit, biodiversity, climate, oceans, you name it. There's a whole bunch of them next year. What do we want to see as commitment areas that we can identify and build and, and really deliver on in the next 12 months? And so we have a great panel. Um, the, the private sector needs to change, it's pretty clear. Um, but as many of us have said, they can't do it on their own. They, systemic change needs complementary actions from all stakeholders. Um, all stakeholders influence the supply, the demand, and the enabling environment for healthy diets and for food production and consumption of nutritious foods. How are we all going to come together? What do we each need to do and how do we do it in a way that's complementary? So this perspective brings perspective, this session brings perspectives from business, government, consumers, and uh, large businesses and SMEs. I'm going to start off, uh, I'm going to introduce each speaker as we go along. I'm not going to introduce them all at the same time, but as we go along. And each speaker has about eight minutes or so to make their comments. Um, I'm first going to start off with uh, Ambassador uh, Yaya Olaniran. Um, he is the he's a, a former minister and a permanent representative of Nigeria to FAO. And since 2007, Ambassador the ambassador has been Nigeria's permanent representative to the UN Rome-based agencies. Um, he's he's a former ag minister and was elected chair of the Committee on World Food Security in 2011, which is a really big deal and a big honor and a recognition of his enormous contributions. And uh, Dr. Alanirin is also a scholar, and he is a scholar of uh, crop production and soil sciences, amongst many other things. Ambassador, welcome. Um, my question for you, Ambassador, is, uh, is simple to ask but difficult to answer. It's, it's really how do you see the challenges and the opportunities picking up on Patrick's talk, Patrick Webb's talk, what are the challenges and the opportunities in Nigeria for government to work with businesses around healthy diets? And what, what are the main things governments can do to make a difference in this in this area? So challenges and opportunities of working with businesses and how can how can the government become more activist in this domain? Ambassador, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, moderator. And thank you for the presentation. Without doubt, there are opportunities, there are challenges. But let me start with the challenges first. Hello, I hope you're he hearing me. Hello? Are yes, you I'm me? hearing you. Oh, lovely. We can hear you. The, yeah. the, way, the way I see it is that we should start with education. 
education in the whole sense of it, starting from the curriculum in schools, primary, secondary, university, and then education of all the people in the value chain of production, utilization, and the homes. We have the challenges of infrastructure. You cannot talk of healthy diet. You cannot talk of uh, healthy food without having the necessary infrastructure to support it, ranging from electricity to the roads, to the rail works, and so on. These are huge, huge, intensive financial implication for government. And in a nation that has the sort of population of Nigeria, with diverse level of education and different levels of ability to get things done. Needs must be put in place deliberately by government, by their partners, both local and international, to see that we are all on the same page. The second point is this, that the understanding of what food really means. In my native language, food is regarded as medicine, but it's not just as medicine uh, in itself, but as medicine in the way you consume it. If you don't have a balanced diet, you are not going to have good health. And we all know that in Nigeria, like in most African countries, we've dealt for too long only on carbohydrates. The proteins come in between spiced. We also have a lot of vegetables and fruits that are not being fully utilized the way we ought to. How do we bring people to understand that you need not only carbohydrates and protein, you need your vegetables as well as fruits to be part and parcel of your diet? Now, the young ones that it's been flagged are very, very critical in being part of the problem and part of the solution. They have what it takes in terms of energy, in terms of knowledge, to begin to work on these issues. But they need to be empowered. In Nigeria, you have millions of graduates every year that come out of the university, technical colleges, with virtually no work to do. And there must be the opportunity to get them fully engaged. A lot of them are underemployed. And honestly, I doff my heart to the young ones, the way they're trying to make ends meet in a very constructive way. I, from what we've heard earlier on, you've seen most of them in the SMEs improving not only food production, but also adding value to the food that they're being processed and uh, marketed. They are able to link the farmers, which 
up to this point are not quite the caliber of farmers that can take us into the into this century as, as such, because most of them are old, they are not educated, but they have been feeding us as a result of their hard work and sweating it out. There must be a, a, an innovation in that area that will make farming less cumbersome, less of drudgery, but with the simple tools that can move them forward and more efficiently. We won't go into the area of the needs of the fertilizers, the right type of crops. But when we also come back to it, there are lots of local food stops that has yet been neglected. We have to organize farming in a way that it will be sustainable and everyone will know that they're part and parcel of it. Government has a big role to play here. The um, private sector are buying into it, but they can still do far more than what they are doing right now. I can imagine what you can call a nucleus farm that is well established and have smaller farms that will be hooked onto them in terms of supply, as well as supervision of the work being done in terms of sanitary expertise and the processing, the harvesting. And at the end, a ready source of taking on the produce. It all has to be worked out in a way that everybody will be part and parcel of it and achieving the success required. Now, we have to move a step back to the meaning of food systems, which is still very hazy, and nutrition. I think we are at a critical point now that we can use the experience of the Committee on World Food Security to annex and have this multi-stakeholder platform to debate and tease out all the bits and pieces of what is still hanging. Unless we have it well spelled out by experts, including all the stakeholders, and then government being at the table, private sector, civil society, and everyone coming from the angle of where and what you are used to, and then having a common understanding before we can move forward. If there's a common understanding, the government will be in a position with education to begin to see how best to handle it. In addition to being former president, uh, you have one minute left, Ambassador. Chair of CFS, we also have somebody who is critically located, the coordinator of the Sun Movement, Ambassador Gada Volga. I think all of us can work together to get this well laid down, sorted out, taking care of livelihood, environment, as well as our health. COVID-19 has really nailed it for us to know we need to work together closer than ever before. The technologies are all there. The manpowers are all there. Let's get the government uh, to put in the infrastructure that will make it workable. Thank you and over. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was fascinating. You, I like the fact that you highlighted areas outside of agriculture that were so important for food systems, uh, education and infrastructure. And I just saw uh, some estimates in the Lancet that came out that said by 2100, by the end of this century, Nigeria will have 800 million people, uh, which will be more than China will have by the end of the century. That is very very sobering. Of course, projections are not destiny, but that was very sobering. And it highlights the importance of investing in infrastructure now 
Um, I like the fact that you talked about um, food as being one of the big drivers of health, uh, the promoters or the underminers of health, and how government could be more activists. Look, um, linking to Patrick Webb's presentation, governments could be much more activists, for example, around vegetables and fruits. You said that SMEs are a big part of the uh, solution, but they, they lacked voice, they need to be empowered. Uh, they, they could be, a, they could be a, a good solution for some of the uh, potential uh, unemployment, to solve some of the potential unemployment that will happen in Nigeria in the next decade. Uh, and I think you came up with a really interesting idea about uh, uh, sort of a nutritious farms, and you emphasized the importance of multi-stakeholder platforms for essentially hammering out the principles of engagement that Patrick Webb mentioned earlier on. So thank you so much for your intervention. I'm now going to move on to Sherry uh, Atilano. Sherry is the president and founder of Agria, which is an agro-social enterprise that aims to eradicate poverty for farming and fishing families in the Philippines and, and beyond. And she's won numerous awards for her work. And in 2019, she was appointed a UN Nutrition Ambassador. So welcome, Sherry. Uh, Sherry, we've heard a lot in the last few days of the critical role that micro and SMEs play in food value chains. And you've just heard the ambassador talk about their critical role in Nigeria. They're the backbone for the food system for most consumers, certainly consumers in low income contexts. What is needed from governments to help SMEs to do a better job? And then what can SMEs do themselves to rise to this challenge? Sherry, over to you. Sherry, can we, I can't hear you. Um, organizers, do we know if Sherry's on the line? Hello, Hello. this is Candela. I'm not sure that she is. Uh, we are still trying to reach her. We could okay. move on. So uh, let's keep going then. Um, let's move on after my big build up for Sherry. Let's move on to Helena. Is Helena, are you there? Yes? But, and it, yes, I am. Hi, Helena. So let me introduce Helena. And Helena, forgive me if I mess up your last name, but I think it's no Laurent. Laurent? Laurent. Laurent, not even close. My half French oh, wife, wow. me <laughs> pronunciation, sorry. So Helena Laurent is the Director General of Consumers International, uh, which is the membership organization for 200 plus consumer advocacy groups around the world in more than 100 countries. And Consumer International works with members and partners to empower consumers to drive change in the marketplace. Um, ensuring you know, they, they work on issues like digital access and rights and product safety and sustainability. And, and yesterday, uh, Laurent, we heard a lot about uh, how you know, businesses respond to demand and uh, businesses often tell me, well, well, we would do this if consumers would demand different things. And we know businesses can shape demand, but what can consumer associations do to shape demand? Consumer associations have in the past tended to focus on value for money and safety and reliability, but is there a role for consumer organizations around um, shifting demand? To healthy diets and and what what would help consumers to to do that over to you helena perfect so thank you very much lawrence uh it's a pleasure to be uh invited to this group and hello to everybody around the world who's joining first um let me say that uh it's fantastic that as consumer advocacy we're invited to the conversation even though consumer demand is a critical part of this entire story, it's quite marked how infrequently consumers ha are able to express their opinions. And I think the first thing to say is we consider uh, consumer not in the sense as a person who's targeted by businesses or just a user of products, but as an actor in the marketplace and a, an actor who individually or collectively can help 
uh, create a fair, safe and sustainable marketplace. But we're very aware that that's a systemic uh, question. I think it's particularly interesting at the moment as uh, there is a growing awareness of the various crises that we face uh, from climate to inclusivity to nutrition um, and the need for a better social contract, um, we can, I think, help put the people back into policy. Now, um, you mentioned that a lot of what we do is around protection. I would actually say it's also about innovation because if you are trying to imagine a fair, safe and sustainable marketplace for the future, you really start thinking about how the world will look differently and you build. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we are present in 100 countries around the world, slightly over, I think. Um, it's a 60 year old organization. Um, over that time, there has been vast amounts of work around the world, specifically on food. It's one of the, it is the top issue uh, for consumer advocates. And uh, that work has focused on everything from labeling to food waste, to pesticide use, to breast milk substitutes, to a whole range of different pieces of the food system. And you know, those working on this range from organizations with a couple of hundred uh, staff to uh, groups with 20 staff and a, a big grassroots uh, and volunteer base who are typically pulled into conversations about finance and energy and mobility and a whole range of other consumer issues as well as food. And I would say that gives an incredibly broad view of what consumer reality is now. Getting into food and nutrition, um, I think the, the interesting piece is now um, a, couple of, a couple of things about our reflections on what uh, consumers or the changes in how consumers are seeing um, uh, the world. Um, the first would be um, a much greater focus on uh, sustainability and health overall. In fact, um, as if, if that wasn't obvious to all, this year um, we had 160 consumer advocates uh, focused on the topic of the sustainable consumer as part of World Consumer Rights Day. And this reflects a real uh, uh, sea change in, uh, in consumer advocacy. There is also another, there is another sea change going on, which is around collaboration. And um, I really enjoyed before the, the pandemic punched us earlier this year, conversations between consumer advocates and farmers and members of the World Farmers Organization, which really helped greater understanding, but also focused in on exactly where certain labeling approaches could go. I think the thing we also need to be aware of though is of course um, consumers around the world right now are significantly more vulnerable. Uh, we have certainly seen a uh, very large increase in the calls uh, for help from consumers to consumer advocacy groups around the world. An overwhelming amount in fact as people become more financially vulnerable um, and a much greater awareness of um, health in everything. And so I think that uh, I would hope that we could come to this with a, a, a sense and a starting point of talking about how consumers are experiencing um, uh, the world right now. And that will make any approaches or policies or efforts through the various summits that are happening even more relevant and even more powerful if we start with that consumer approach. In your questions, and this is where I'll, I'll end up, you asked what might be the levers that can help. Um, in terms of policy, uh, and a really interesting approach can be to look at where there is consumer protection policy per se. If you don't have consumer protection, how are you, you know, you don't have the starting blocks for a fair marketplace in the first place. 
And then how do you build on that to make sure that people have uh, good nutrition? If you look, uh, it was only last year that Zimbabwe had um, passed their Consumer Protection Act after 10 years of, of effort, likewise in India. And this is even more the case online. If you don't have consumer protection online, how are we supposed to have that more engaged digital marketplace that, that you know, we are relying on so much more for e-commerce? The second piece and the second lever is around enforcement. Um, I think there are you know, the, the number of enforcement agencies for, to support consumers are incredibly divided. There are about 500 in Europe alone. Um, and as we see the growth towards sustainability and, and, and focus on health, you will see an increase in the number of misleading claims. We have to maintain consumers' trust in the change that we're trying to drive. And then um, I would mention standards. Uh, those are, the, of course, the, the hidden supports of a, of a technologically driven society. How do we build those so that they support us as we go along? And finally, um, a level of innovation. So we make some of this truly irresistible. How do we think about a positive, um, attractive future um, where consumers and farmers are, are better linked around a, a more, um, uh, a, a fairer, safer and healthier marketplace? Just finally, um, one of the interesting things that we've seen recently as we worked in uh, six low-income communities in India was how um, certain things helped uh, low-income consumers engage more with sustainable products. And I think there are potentially some interesting points from that. One is absolutely about starting with the consumer and their lives. So if there was any comment I would have about the fantastic background materials um, that we received for this, I would say when we got to the demand section, you started with cabbage and quinoa. I would have started with Sari and Saroja and Teresa and Marta and all of the people who are having to make multiple purchase decisions uh, and all sorts of life decisions every single day. Um, I think the other part, though, was around consumer rights and uh, bringing consumers together to be aware of their rights. Because as soon as you are aware that you can ask for something different, um, then things start to change. You can build that system uh, even in these uh, situations because you can start working uh, with consumers to, to develop demand and at the same time um, support retailers or manufacturers to take advantage of, for example, in this case, subsidies that they weren't aware of. So I think um, in some, to answer your question, there is a vast amount that consumer advocacy can do. Um, there is a tipping point, there is a moment of change, uh, which is really exciting and gives us many opportunities. And if we take a uh, systemic view and the look really um, carefully at the levers, but taking a consumer-centric view of how to create change, there, um, there is a really um, real reason for optimism, even in these dark days. Thank, thank you, Helena. That was really fascinating. Um, I, I, just some things that re resonated with me. Consumers are, are active marketplace participants. They, shape, they can be shapers of marketplaces. Food is one of the top issues for consumers. Um, we're seeing more collaboration between farmers and consumer groups. That, that's got to be great. I think the, you said build on what's already there in terms of policy, the protection policies, uh, enforcement agencies coming together, standards um, being stronger and maybe more consistent. And, you know, making these healthy and sustainable purchases irresistible. Um, you said there's, we're, we're kind of at a tipping point or close to a tipping point. And if I was, if I was, a, um, if I was a hard headed business leader, I'd be saying to myself, yeah, that's, that's good. But are consumers really, and this is a really quick follow up question, a quick follow up answer from you, please, Helena. Um, are consumers really willing to reward 
uh, companies that make a bigger effort to produce healthier foods because in, at least initially they, they may be slightly more expensive over the answer to that is yes, absolutely. We think often the, the problem or the barrier is lack of choice, lack of experience, um, and those things can be remedied. Okay, great. That's really encouraging to hear, Helena. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try Sherry again. Is Sherry on the line? Sherry Atalano. Uh, yes. Hi, Sherry. So Hi, we've, already, we've already introduced you, Sherry. <laughs> um, Thank you so welcome. much. Sorry about that oh, time difference. <laughs> uh, no worries. It's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Sherry, um, I've already introduced you. I mean, the, and the, the questions we, we have for you, Sherry, are, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, SMEs and, and micro SMEs, uh, the role they play in food value chains. They're the backbone of food systems for most most countries, most local food systems. The, so the two questions for you really are, what, what do SMEs need from government to, to be more, to be a bigger part of the food system transformation? And what can SMEs do themselves to rise to the challenge? Over to you, Sherry. Well, thank you so much for that uh, two questions, Lawrence. Actually, this is so timely because I was just actually just finished a Zoom meeting with our Department of Trade Secretary and the Agriculture Secretary. We're talking about how to bounce back the industry through the small uh, medium enterprises and the micro medium enterprises. So I'm coming from the Philippines where our economy, especially in business, is actually 99.6% is composed of SMEs and MSME. So the only solution for this one is really for the Philippines to take on the challenge and how to actually extend capitalization support on SMEs because um, before a lot of them cannot have enough access from finance because of the, the interest requirements and in the Philippines somehow uh, investments is scarce, especially inside the country. You know, most of our economies is controlled by family businesses. And if there's investment coming, those family businesses are still, you know, getting all of those investments. And, but during this pandemic, it was a living proof that SMEs are the ones thriving, the ones somehow sustaining the economy. And it's a big challenge to the government to step up. So right now the government is trying to um, promote loans for MSME from the Department of Trade and also requiring banks to actually structure a loan and investment system or a debt or whatever arrangement just to plow money for this uh, small medium enterprises. And um, second one, because especially in the food supply chain, you know, the big, big traders uh, who are like somehow running the cartel are mostly dependent from import of food. So Philippines, somehow we import a lot of food from other countries, especially from our neighboring countries. And this entire cartel system is kind of not working. And a lot of them are not also adjusted well to running into a small enterprise because they're known to like big, big rice cartel or whatever commodity we try to import from other countries. So another challenge now that the government is actually facing is how to provide infrastructure for the small medium enterprises because um, for example in food you know some small medium enterprises are uh, trading and supplying hotels and restaurants and now they closed and now it's more of a b2c rather than a b2b kind of business so in running a b2c a lot of logistics uh, support are not there. So the government are asked, how can you provide logistics support infrastructure for the small medium enterprises? And for the micro ones, these are mostly the cooperatives of farmers present on the ground. And this pandemic actually just put a lot of pressure and a prominent discussion on the uh, micro enterprises, especially the farmer cooperatives. So for the longest time, I think it's not only in in the Philippines, but it's very common in developing countries, that these farmer access to investments are, are negligible. You know, so the banks now, especially the, um, the, the banks that are owned by the government, are asked how to design um, loan, loan packets for farmers so that they can survive. Because for the last three months, 
they they lost their market but at the same time whatever harvest they had it supplied the consumers but for the next trench of farming uh this micro enterprises have nowhere to go so it's like crunch time actually of stress to the government on how to to also convince this banking and loaning institutions and also trying to control the existing you know, unscrupulous kind of loan to farmers, or sometimes they call it loan sharks, right, in developing countries. So the government is like trying to put a security system on how this ridiculous um, loaning to farmers can also be controlled in a way. And, and the third one, there's also, um, aside from the infrastructure, the literal like logistic support that the government should give to, to SME and MSME, is digitizing of platform. So like, for example, uh, during this pandemic, there were, you know, left and right mushrooming of digitizing of food deliveries or even commodity deliveries to household because they're not allowed to go out of their house. Like Manila, we are 100% in total lockdown. If you go out of your house in the first one month, the military and the police will put you to prison. So it's pretty hard. So a lot of the delivery system are actually existing. However, our internet system is also challenged. So the government now is trying to push on how to support the digitizing of some micro and medium enterprises and SME because somehow there's no way to, to do the selling outside, but really to digitalization of, of, of their commodity. So those are the things that um, are a bit of a challenge, but it's really basically more on how to plow back in investment to this um, company so that they can also bounce back easily at the same time. And um, I think another, another one also is support to manpower. You know, most of these uh, SMEs are not having really good HR support system, right? And and that's actually where the government is coming from because, you know, contractual is actually not also pretty easy. So what kind of labor system would you also be adjusting and be committing moving forward? Yeah. So it's a lot of challenges along the way, but for sure, um, you know, most of the SMEs are very innovative. They, they are so fast to respond. I actually had this conversation uh, this afternoon with the DTI, with the Department of Trade, that most SMEs are easy to bounce back than big corporations. Because a lot of big corporations, they have this brand label that they need to protect. But a lot of SMEs, they don't have really a like, huge brand label that they need to protect. So it's kind of easy for them to go to the market or innovate new product or innovate new interventions. However, though, uh, like for example, in the Philippines setting now, and I think other countries are trying to adopt, um, the government did a freeze of price. So we freeze price. So, so that the price of commodity is of certain, um, uh, certain limit so that it's not, it's not expensive for SMEs to actually have uh, a lot of expense of the raw materials, especially if you know they are, they're into processing of food or other products. So we develop this um, free uh, freeze of pricing in the Philippines, and then another one is tax support to SMEs. So there are SMEs that they develop new products, and somehow these products are 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 not yet approved. For example, by the Department of Health, but it's needed by the market and the tax system is you know is too high so the government is also adjusting on what kind of tax system they can restructure or they can adjust to accommodate this kind of businesses as long as it's ethical enough that it it's it still uh, aligned to the government laws and regulations so so far um to to recap it's about investments in smes Second one, support and labor laws that the SMEs should follow and the government also will put guidelines for readjustment. And the third one is taxation support also to SMEs to bounce back. Thank you, Sherry. That was so, um, I love the way you, you were able to connect the big picture with the, the practical on the ground stuff that needs to happen. And I'm 
you know, your presentation makes me, uh, it sort of reinforces the fact that SMEs are really important to keep things going. And I like the fact that you sort of countered the conventional wisdom is that the, the big companies can bounce back better than the SMEs. But you're saying actually many SMEs are really able to bounce back and government needs to catch up with their creativity and innovation. Another thing you mentioned that made me think that, you know, is COVID going to be an accelerant to government investment in infrastructure? And the ambassador from Nigeria also mentioned the criticality of uh, infrastructure. And I just wonder whether in going from a B2B world to a B2C world, uh, uh, infrastructure will be, hard infrastructure will be forced to be invested in, as well as the softer kinds of infrastructure around labor and um, digitization. So thank you so much, Sherry, for a really fascinating uh, session. Um, and now we're going to t- uh, turn to our last speaker, uh, who is our last panelist, who's Peter Bakker. Um, Peter has led uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Val- Development since 2012. And WBCSD is a global CEO-led organization of over 200 leading businesses working together to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. Ah, Peter is a... Você não vai fazer, Miguel? Miguel, você não vai fazer. Se recupera. Peter is a distinguished business leader who until 2011 served as the CFO and CEO of TNTNV, which is the global transport and logistics company. So he knows a thing or two about infrastructure. Um, Peter has been at the forefront of business leadership for the SDGs. Uh, Peter, and he's recently been appointed the business representative on the UN Food System Summit Advisory Board. He's also a good source of uh, alternative indie music, if any of you are interested in that. Peter, what opportunities yeah. and challenges do we see or do you see in the next 12 months for businesses in the lead up to the Food System Summit and Nutrition for Growth Summit? And how can these milestones really stimulate innovation, leadership and partnership for for business and with other stakeholders. So basically, how do we capitalize on the next 12 months? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, I, I thought you were gonna ask for the latest music, but Fontaine DZ, oh, July 31st. Uh, would be, oh, there you uh, go, thank you, I like that, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, to your question, I, I think um, there's indeed a lot on the cooker for the next uh, 12 months. I actually want to start with the, uh, the SOFI 2020 report that was uh, launched, uh, I think, 10 days ago. I'm, I'm hoping we can position that report as uh, like the IPBES report was for, uh, for biodiversity or some of the IPCC work on climate change, because it creates an inescapable sense of urgency around this whole track of uh, healthy and sustainable diets. Um, I think the COVID-19 crisis, the, the other panelists have talked about it, <clears throat> as well, is really creating a sense of urgency. Um, all businesses around the world are now trying to maintain safety for their employees, their customers. Uh, the food companies in particular are working hard to ensure that the vital supply chains do not collapse. And all business will be looking at how do we improve long-term resilience. I think what all these elements bring on the table is there's now a very urgent need to transform the food system. Um, I think this was first highlighted in the Folio report uh, that was launched during the General Assembly week last year. Uh, the CEO guide to food system transformation at the WBCSD launched made that same point. And it all now culminates into uh, the food system summit to which you said, uh, indeed, I, I am honored to take part uh, in the advisory committee. What I like about the Food System Summit, it has created five very clear uh, action tracks. I'm sure they have been mentioned many times on the, on the sessions today, but ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all is actually action track number one to the topic of this agenda. But there is shifting to sustainable consumption patterns boosting nature positive production, advancing equitable livelihoods and value distribution, and building resilience to vulnerabilities, shocks and stresses. I would actually call on any organization, and there are now many organizations, businesses, consumer organizations, farmers, policymakers working on these topics. Let's try to align behind those five tracks. Let's not all start our own initiatives. 
and put new labels on them, please let's all work towards the five tracks. Because what I was listening to the ambassador who was so uh, ele elegant in telling us what a uh, healthy diet would actually look like, or if I was listening to Elena, how awake and aware consumers now are, um, I think all our agendas are really converging. And it would be great if we used the same framework to talk about uh, solutions. When it comes to uh, business mobilization, I'm actually very positive at this stage. Uh, a few years ago in the preparation of uh, COP21, it was really hard to get food and ag companies interested in the climate agenda. That has completely changed. Uh, the number of companies that are now participating in our work around the uh, CEO Guide to Food System Transformation is enormous. The number of new initiatives that are emerging uh, is really positive. So I expect business to really come forward as a force uh, of real solutions. Um, for, when it comes to healthy and sustainable diets, uh, I think um, uh, we need to create, um, it, it, it's obviously a key to the food system transformation. Um, and what we are creating and what will be launched at the pre-food summit later in the year in Wageningen, is a healthy and sustainable diets roadmap that will be looking at what are the targets and the priorities that companies should consider setting. How do we deal with nutrition, proteins, plants, and importantly and challengingly, uh, how do we deal with consumer behavior? So um, I, again, I was very optimistic uh, listening to Helena, but I really think we need to possibly consider doing things together, Helena, because consumer behavior uh, is in my opinion, uh, one of the least explored areas on how can we mobilize the, the force of consumer behavior. Because one point you made earlier, uh, Lawrence, um, companies will change, but they will change an awful lot faster if they believe demand is there to support such change. Um, I think the challenge we will all face is that we have to continuously remember that we talk about the food system transformation. So we cannot just talk about uh, healthy diets or equitable livelihoods or climate change. We're gonna have to work hard to find solutions that cr cut across all of these. And that I think is, uh, is going to be the real challenge that uh, hopefully the Food System Summit, uh, the, uh, the Nutrition for Growth Summit, the pre-summit in Wageningen, but even COP26 and, and the COP15 for biodiversity can contribute. So in summary, uh, very optimistic, clear agenda has been shaped um, and uh, business will be ready to participate. I saw in the chat, there was a question uh, aimed at me. Um, so maybe a, a few answers to that one. Peter, go ahead. I, I think um, the, uh, the CEO guide to Food System Transformation, which if you have never seen it, you can find it on wbcsd.org website, uh, gives a clear strategic map. Uh, then um, we have created together with a whole bunch of other organizations, the um, Positive Nutrition plat Pledge, which uh, sets out commitments for companies to make on nutrition. And then, as I said, the, uh, the roadmap that will be published at the pre-summit uh, later this year will get even into more specific uh, targets and priorities that companies should set. Thank you. Peter, thank you. I know you have to leave very soon, but uh, there was a couple of comments in the, in the chat box uh, that are skeptical. You know, they're saying, um, and I think it's good to be skeptical, saying, look, you can, companies can say they'll do X, Y, and Z, but until they actually do it, until we, until the rest of us can see that they've actually done it and done it well, why, you know, why would we trust them to do that? Any reflections or comments on that? I, well, first and foremost, let me, let me acknowledge that uh, I, I understand, particularly in the food system, trust in companies and particularly in large companies is always uh, comes at a challenge. And, uh, and the only way to really overcome trust is to agree the framework at which these solutions are being designed, to agree the targets, and, and hence my answer to the question, that companies should be held accountable to, and then to really integrate it into 
the progress reports that business will make. You know, I don't think that uh, sending a bunch of CEOs to the summit, making speeches and, and making commitments is enough anymore. We need targets, we need commitments, but what we really need is visible, measurable, and, and accountable uh, progress against those targets. So yeah, um, I'm aware of, uh, of occasionally low trust. I'm not scared by it uh, because I think things like COVID, but also the reports like SOVI uh, are really making the, the urgency and the, and the case for change clear. And business is very aware that if we do not change, if we do not provide solutions, the license to operate here is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think we've got about, uh, and your answer was very similar to the answers given in the chat box, actually. Um, I think we've got about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit less than that, to um, take some questions from the floor. And there are lots of questions. Peter, you've answered some of them. Um, there's a question uh, from Ndidi and Welly about, uh, to Helena about uh, food fraud and Africa is a victim. Uh, how can we address the double standards from the source companies and amplify awareness uh, in consumers about food fraud? Um, we've got, um, uh, let's see, we've got some questions in French that I'm hopeless at doing, I'm afraid. Um, Peter, there, a lot of the questions were for you, but I think you've answered um, several of them. Um, there was a question uh, about um, about what can Nigeria do? Uh, what can what can the rest of Africa? You know, is, Nigeria is a is a is an entry point for West Africa. It's a lung. Someone described it as a force for West Africa on food and nutrition security. How can Nigeria become a leader? Is it ready to ready to do that? Um, and uh, yeah, those so questions are mostly for for Helena and Peter and the ambassador. Uh, colleagues, but uh, you know, you can see colleague panelists, you can see the chat box as well as I can. Uh, are there any of those that you'd like to answer? Uh, please go ahead. Maybe we can start with uh, Helena. Sure, although you overestimate my eyesight, I think. Um, so there were great questions. Thank you so much for sharing these. I think there was an important one early on about human rights and consumer rights. Those are interlinked. They are also complementary. Um, we need our human rights. I think consumer rights can then enable uh, and uh, support our presence in the marketplace specifically. And I would say both of those things are crucial. Um, I was just reading a, a great report this morning from the FAO about how those two things uh, come together. I think the second point about um, products that are substandard, um, you see that across multiple sectors, of course. Um, it's not just in food. And I think the, the, there is a piece which is businesses trying to make the business case work when infrastructure costs and other elements uh, uh, make it more difficult. So there, there is an element about the enabling environment being in place, but I think it is absolutely about that there is something about a um, uh, greater enforcement and it brings me to a great question, which uh, is further down where somebody said, how could we put together structures of government, uh, business? No, I think you had government and consumer uh, advocacy. Those are in existence. Um, in a lot of places, you have consumer advocacy is able to join in through uh, a formal structure. It doesn't happen often enough. It's often underfunded. Um, that can be built up, back to your point, uh, Lawrence. We can do this much better and actually bring together that whole of government uh, perspective. And then I think there was one other, but maybe I'll stop there, Lawrence, unless you've seen anything yeah. I should definitely jump in on. Uh, no, that was great. Um, thank you. Um, Ambassador, would you like to reflect on anything? Uh, you may be on mute, Ambassador. Thank you. Three quick ones. One is on the issue of getting uh, a better understanding or a common understanding by all stakeholders. And I want to refer us to the voluntary guideline on food systems and nutrition uh, 
which the CFS is working on. And hopefully, when it is negotiated and agreed upon, every one of us should be an advocate that it should be used at the local level, uh, government and regional level, so that we can go into the Japan Nutrition for Growth as well as the uh, Food Summit well equipped and having a better understanding of where we want to go. Uh, Nigeria as entry point is a good one. In fact, if you can get 200 million people to buy into what we are trying to do with the food system, you can be sure that every other African will be a partner going forward. But without that, we still have that big problem of not using what we have within our food culture. There are lots of food materials that are indigenous, food knowledge that should not be allowed to perish. And the way we consume the food, when you sit down to eat your food in the family setting where you have to communicate and have a chat and solve problems, this is also important to how the food uh, works in us and within the, the family setup. The, the third one has to do with how the, I don't want to be anti-globalization, but if you look at the West African or even African food bill, it's filled with the food that we do not really need. Most of them are junk food. So COVID has brought in other factors that is giving us headache, like canned food and so on. However, as much as possible, let us eat fresh food and fresh fruits and vegetables. And then we shall see less of the doctor. Doctors will do something else. Thank yeah. you, Adoba. Thank you, Ambassador. We're all trying to put doctors out of business. That's good. Um, Thank you. There were some more questions. That, that, quickly, I'm going to answer a couple of questions. There were a couple coming in about connecting the two summits, the Nutrition Summit and the Food System Summit. I understand that the, the folks will be doing Action Track 1, which is Nutritious Food, um, will be connecting into the Food System bit of the Nutrition for Growth Summit. So I think those discussions are just beginning, but it's a good, really good question. We must connect those two things. And there was a question about rights. If anyone would like to uh, answer that, that would be good. It's, it's basically about, you know, uh, one thing that links all of these different components up around food systems is, is rights, um, whether it's consumer rights or uh, the rights of individuals or, or the uh, obligations of the state to deliver. Uh, rights can, uh, much as we talk about rights being indivisible, they can make these different outcomes that we care about in, uh, indivisible as well. So any, any comments on that? Um, yeah. Well, I, I can add in, I mean, I, I think what, you know, what we saw in uh, the case that I mentioned was the, the greater awareness of rights amongst consumers enabled, you know, a, a girl to walk into her local retail, uh, the local retailer in the village and uh, ask for something different. It enables you know, a whole different view of what's possible. Um, so from, a, from that perspective, I would say absolutely yes. I also think it links, it does create a linkage, but then one has to remember that in some places, uh, consumer rights will be accepted where you know, there, are, there will be different perceptions of which rights uh, are uh, contentious or not. So um, when there are places where we need to take a very, um, uh, where this works, um, and I think then there is a, a local conception of rights which we need to be sensitive to. 
Thank you, Helena. Sherry, would you like to come in on any of the comments you've seen or questions? Um, of course, you know, uh, right now it's, it's the best time that we need to be healthy. Like for example, um, I, here in Asia, I had this session with the economist and they were holding about food systems in this pandemic and all this crisis and actually uh, it's posing a lot of challenges to, 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 to big corporations that are producing food and feeding most of our population, right? And right now, uh, the demand of people is how they can have access to fresh commodities. And actually, Lawrence, there's also an irony in here. If you see the news all over right now in terms of food systems, this, what's most broken is there are overproduction of farmers and there's no way for them to bring it to the market. Uh, you know, a lot of produce of the farmers now are being wasted. You know, you see news in the U.S. They're just dripping milk out because there's no way to bring it to the market. And however, another challenge is also to, one, I love the rights of having the, the consumer's rights to, to the right food. But at the same time, the sensitivity, especially on countries without uh, so much money to afford uh, quality goods. Um, there's still... Um, you know, there's still this stigma that it's, it's healthy food, it's expensive, right? So all the more that these people without, you know, with limited resources, uh, and now a lot of people are not actually having their livelihood or source of income, they resort to unhealthier food choices. Even if they have the right to also, of course, to eat a healthy food, however, their income, uh, in comparison to their capacity of buying power, they still cannot have access to that kind of healthier option, right? So it's another sensitivity that we actually need to recognize. And uh, somehow, like for example, um, here in Asia setting, there's so much discussion on how Asia can actually be sustainable in itself because we're so very, you know, global trade is beautiful, but uh, there's also an issue of food nationalism to strengthen our, our supply chain uh, internally in every country. Right, like for example, in Africa, Nigeria is basically the lung of Africa, right? And in terms of nutrition and agriculture. However, you still have dependency of following the global trade. Like for example, in my country, Philippines, we need to respect the global trade and we accept products that actually our people doesn't need. So it's, it's actually challenging uh, what's supposed to be right by sourcing local, supporting our farmers locally, supporting our small producers locally and eat healthy. However, you also have this government policies of you know, uh, accepting the trading and global trading and commissioning goods that's coming in in the country. So those are like two ironic ones. Uh, the global trade that we're trying to respect that our countries or respected countries signed up for. And second one is how do we really strengthen sourcing local? Like really focusing on what are we eating as people? What are we known to be eating in terms of, uh, because during this pandemic, you know, we we are we we become dependent on what we have from our own land because there's no trading coming in so it's more of an awakening and enlightening of reviewing our diet of you know there's like a culture or anthropology of food actually now that's i was involved in discussion like what's really the diet of the philippines what's really the diet of you know of the singaporeans what's really the diet of the indonesians why are we eating this food that it's actually not in our diet in the first place who influence us so it's more of an awakening of focusing on food nationalism strengthening local production strengthening local sourcing and demanding the government to invest where the right investment should go to Thank you, let Sherry. Me, let, let me jump in, Lawrence, because you somebody can, has you been so kind. If, you, if you're quick. Yeah. Somebody okay. has been so kind to translate for me the French question. I think basically Nigeria, through uh, ECOWAS, can formulate for the whole of West Africa and Africa in terms of uh, nutritious food and the way of doing it. And I agree with the last point made by Sherry, that we have to go back to local food produced locally for better health and so on. Thank you. Over. Thank you. I, mean, I think that was a Thank you. fantastic panel. I mean, one of the things that comes through really strongly, I can't really summarize it, it's too rich and diverse for that, but one of the things that comes through 
really strongly is that we really do seem to be in a in a time where change is possible you know things are we're having to rethink a whole range of things whether it's uh, how does how is our infrastructure infrastructure set up or not set up to promote lo local sourcing which we have to do more of um, what's happening to our digitization um, it ha we, we need to do more work uh, digitally but uh, you know that means governments have to do stuff as well as businesses have to do stuff um, and um, the whole issue about consumer rights um, consumer you know uh, information and evidence is the first casualty of any crisis well we can't let information about what foods are eaten the provenance the safety the, the quality the nutritional value we can't let that be the first casualty of this crisis so the, the roles of consumers are even more important to say you know we need to be informed and we can't make healthy choices and, unless we are and if unless those healthy choices are actually there for us to make so I, I think that was a fantastic session. Uh, thank you to the uh, for, to the participants who contributed really good questions and comments in the chat box, uh, and thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Ambassador Helena, Sherry, and Peter. Thank you, everybody. Steve, back to you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. I think we'll move straight on now. We're pretty much on time. Um, I'm going to now ask um, Bob Bechtel, the Deputy Director General. A foul to take over. Beth, I think we can take an extra five minutes. We'll squeeze Lawrence and uh, Maximo at the end to be brief. So please feel free to go to about um, 15 minutes after the hour. Um, I now pass the word to you. Great. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Lawrence. I think uh, this next panel will follow very uh, appropriately from this previous discussion. And I think in many ways may also serve as a bit of a capstone to the entire three days that have been spent together. Because as we have now talked quite extensively about the importance of policy, of investment, of infrastructure, and of innovation to making sure that we have commitments to more nutritious and healthy diets, this particular panel is now ready to focus on the global opportunities to achieve these healthier diets. And I think most importantly, to focus on sustained engagement and ensuring that we also stay true to measuring progress and making sure that we hold ourselves accountable to monitoring and working towards these kinds of commitments that have been discussed thus far. So we have a great panel, uh, three friends and colleagues of many of us that I'm looking forward to hearing from. And I will also, as Lawrence did, introduce each of them individually. Specifically, we have asked them to really focus on priorities over the next 10 years. So not just the immediate challenges that have been addressed thus far over these last few days, but to focus on how specifically can we make progress over the next 10 years and hold ourselves accountable to working towards these shared commitments for healthier and nutritious diets. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first panelist, Rocco Rinaldi. Rocco, it's good to see you again. We met just recently. It's nice to see you in this forum. Rocco is the Secretary General of the International Food and Beverage Alliance, IFBA. IFBA is a group of 11 of the largest international food and beverage companies dedicated to developing, implementing, and promoting best practices around health and nutrition. And he also is here with us on behalf of the business constituency group that is working on the pledge for the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Rocco, we have a couple of questions that we've posed to you. And as you've heard, to stay on time, we'll try to keep comments to about seven to eight minutes. But the areas that we wanted to focus your uh, reflections on relate to, as you think about your membership, what are the ambitions of these larger businesses that are involved in the food system around shifting towards healthier diets in a more sustainable and inclusive manner? How would you characterize their level of ambition towards this goal? And how can we translate that into more measurable, as we said, and accountable types of results? 
Finally, we'd also ask that you focus your comments a bit on the constraints that you see, the areas that we still have work to do to bring even more of this change through our business and private sector partners. Rocco, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Beth. Good to see you again, and um, thank you for the, for the invite to this panel. Um, in the in the seven years that I've been uh, running the Food and Beverage Alliance, um, much of my work has actually been about aligning companies uh, which are fierce competitors and, and brokering collective commitments amongst them. And a set of global commitments has been a core to IFPA since uh, the outset in 2008. These are on uh, product formulation and innovation, so working on salt, sugar, saturated fat reduction, portion control, but also the inclusion of positive nutrients, on responsible marketing, on nutrition labeling, uh, and on, on healthy lifestyles at the workplace and in the communities. And these are also the areas that are highlighted, uh, amongst others, as areas for private sector action in the, in the UN uh, Global Political Declaration on NCDs. We do have some measurable outcomes for these commitments. So thousands of products have been uh, reformulated around the world and have a, a better nutritional profile today than they did 10 years ago. We phased out industrially uh, produced trans fats um, globally across these companies' portfolios. Uh, the responsible marketing standard that IFPA has set has been replicated industry-wide in over uh, 50 markets uh, by way of example. Um, beyond nutrition, um, all of the member companies have a range of, I would say, quite ambitious commitments on other aspects of the food, chain, of the food system, ranging from sustainable th sourcing through food waste, through climate change, through renewable energy, uh, water stewardship, etc. In a sense, um, the most difficult area is perhaps the one about nutrition because we're talking about the product itself um, and not only the production processes. Uh, so, of course, in the area of nutrition, a lot more still, still needs to be done. And commitments cannot be static um, as, as we make progress and as also as, as new challenges emerge, commitments need to evolve. Most importantly, though, they need to be made at scale. Uh, obviously, scale matters for impact, but it, it matters particularly if we want to shift the marketplace. You asked me, Beth, what, what, is, what are some of the biggest barriers to making commitments? And one of, one of them is, is the impact that, in particular, ambitious commit, commitments on, a, on an individual company level can have on business, uh, because companies simply cannot afford to lose consumers. By way of example, if I'm company X and I reduce salt content by 30% uh, on my own, I may well lose customers to company Y that has not. Um, the innovation will have failed to nobody's benefit. And it is only in a collective commitment that we can progressively shift the market towards demand for that lower sodium alternative. So we need more action at the collective industry level and including, I would say, uh, more across the value chain. A significant difficulty that, that we face um, is that often broader national interest industries are not really prepared to take collective action, uh, especially in, in low and middle income countries. The food industry is often not organized. There is no industry association and there is not always the uh, necessary awareness of the need and the opportunity to act. So we need to work together with government and, and others to make mutually reinforcing changes, which I know is a theme of the Tokyo summit and I think an important one. That said, a lot is happening actually rapidly. I think we are in the midst of a major shift in consumer awareness and demand. And as um, uh, Helena, I, I think, said earlier, health and sustainability are today much more front of mind among consumers across very different markets. And companies are actually racing to transform their portfolios uh, and their businesses to meet this, this burgeoning demand. So health and sustainability are fast becoming, I think, part of the competitive playing field for companies. Now, because I'm here on behalf also of the, of the business constituency group for Tokyo, I wanted to say a few things about uh, that. In, in preparation of the Tokyo summit, we've been part of this group, um, which alongside um, GAIN, the Sun Business Network, WBCSD, 
the Consumer Goods Forum in Food Industry Asia and ATNI, we have developed something called the um, Tokyo 2020 Responsible uh, Business Pledge for Better Nutrition. Um, the pledge uh, includes, um, first of all, it's open for signature by any business and business organization uh, in any sector and in, at any stage of the value chain that has a, an impact on nutrition. Um, it, first of all, it sets out some fundamental requirements. So if you want to be part uh, of this pledge, a company has to, um, uh, number one, be prepared to make some public statements, one on recognizing the urgency of the global challenge of improving nutrition and its centrality to the SDGs. Secondly, to recognize the important role that the private sector must play and commit to positive action. And thirdly, uh, to call on governments to shape en enabling environments, uh, not least through a whole of government thinking and policy coherence. Signatories also need to commit to um, one, making better nutrition a long-term board level priority. Secondly, to put in place corporate strategies to make meaningful contributions across all the nutrition-related SDGs. And thirdly, to put in place measures to ensure that investments in nutrition take into account the systemic nature of the food system so that they don't have, for instance, perverse effects on, on, on other aspects of the food system. Beyond these general commitments, signatories uh, will be asked um, to make uh, commitments in at least uh, three of uh, seven areas that have been uh, agreed on. And these are um, number one, nutrition smart agriculture. Secondly, product formulation innovation. Thirdly, business models for improved nutrition. Fourthly, responsible marketing. Number five, promotion of healthy eating. Number six, workforce nutrition. And lastly, finance and investment for improved nutrition. Importantly, all commitments will need to be uh, smart, i.e. Uh, specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, and it'll have to be reported on regularly through the uh, Tokyo N4G accountability framework. Now, I, I don't want to give the impression that private sector commitments are, are a panacea. Uh, they, they are certainly necessary and desirable, particularly if they are smart and if they are made at scale but they will not by themselves engender systemic change. For that, we certainly need policy frameworks. And the policy approach needs to be a holistic one, one that takes a food systems perspective, because we know that if we're aiming to improve nutrition by looking only at nutrition, uh, we are setting ourselves up, up for failure. And it was said yesterday, but I want to emphasize it, that we need more governments to actively develop food policies. Very few actually have one today. And the private sector needs to con contribute its views, it, its insights, and its expertise into that process. But it is ultimately government that must take the leadership. And the European Union is perhaps brailing a, a, a trail in this area with its uh, newly unveiled farm to fork strategy. So looking at the 2021 Food Systems Summit, I think a desirable but um, a fundamental basic outcome would be a commitment by each participating government to develop a national food policy. Um, regarding the Tokyo uh, pledge, uh, we are currently socializing that amongst our networks, um, but if anyone on this webinar is interested, uh, uh, feel free to contact me or also Steve at GAIN or WBCSD. And while this pledge is designed for the Tokyo summit, uh, and so it's specific to nutrition, I think it may be useful to consider also a similar approach for the private sector commitments to be made at the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit across obviously the broader spectrum of, of that agenda. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Rocco, for, for that intervention and the presentation. I think you made some very important points about the contributions, but also in some ways the uh, what you might call limitations, as you said, of just how far the private sector being viewed as uh, a single contributor to some of this work uh, can realistically be viewed. And it shows that it takes the kinds of partnerships and the kinds of engagement collaboratively here that we're discussing to ultimately bring this kind of success together. You've also very nicely uh, teed up our next two presenters uh, in talking about both the Food Systems Summit 
and also the Nutrition for Growth Summit. So as a moderator, I always appreciate that kind of uh, uh, streamlining. I'd like to go ahead and turn to our next presenter who is stepping in today for our friend and colleague, Ambassador Agnes Calibata. Today we are joined by Martin Frick. Uh, Martin is the deputy of the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Food Systems Summit 2021. Martin served previously as the senior director for UN Climate Change, where he oversaw the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the Secretariat's climate action work. And previously, he was director of climate change right here at FAO. Martin, it's very nice to meet you for the first time virtually here via Zoom. I've heard tremendous things about you from my colleagues here at FAO, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Over to you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General, and a big pleasure to meet you virtually. I was just thinking the same thing. We didn't have a chance to meet in person, but I hope by September the corona situation will be such that I can actually come um, to Rome. Um, I also wanted to thank for the whole initiative of this cooperation between FAO and GAIN, because not least it's a tremendous learning opportunity for me and for the team around the Food System Summit on seeing the tremendous work that's going on. And I'm very happy to also have um, Amy on our panel to talk to us about the Nutrition for Growth Summit in Japan, because of course our summit is not happening in a vacuum, um, but it's um, part of a big international effort to really place food systems at the heart of the sustainable development goals where they actually belong. And coming from UN climate change, I can tell you that still in the climate change negotiation, it's still sort of an uphill battle to really get food systems to the centrality that they are playing not only for climate, but for everything which is interfacing between human health, planetary health, and you know the biodiversity around us. So maybe I can speak, um, I, I guess I have eight minutes, if that's correct. Um, so I'm having one eye on the time. Um, I can speak very briefly about this summit, what it tries to achieve and how we are trying to achieve that. And I think it fits wonderfully in some of the remarks that I have heard in the previous panel also from Peter Becker and from Helena and the ambassador from Nigeria, um, which basically, made the first point of we can only really substantially move ahead with that if we finally understand food as a system. If we see the interdependencies between consumer behaviors that Elena put very eloquently in the previous panel, um, the central role of business, and I was very um, happy to hear Peter basically calling upon particularly also small and medium-sized enterprises because they play such a central role, not only for nutrition, but also for building resilience of our supply chains. And many people only needed corona to finally understand how much their very lives is depending on their work. So the Food System Summit, in autumn next year, we'll try to make this case and bring all of the different stakeholders together and bring that ideally into a set of high-level principles that could really be endorsed by many different stakeholders, including countries, but not only countries. There would be academia, NGOs, most importantly, private sector companies, um, but also consumer associations, everybody really. And I think there is a space because in food systems, um, we are lacking still this holistic view of everything that's already out there that would influence what we do on food systems, such as the Paris goal of staying well below two degrees centigrade or think about SDG 15, land degradation neutrality, but also what is missing and what needs to be put much more prominently, such as nutrition. And when we defined our five action tracks, um, we put food security, food safety, access to food and nutritious food as our action track number one. It's the overarching concern that we need to live up. The other 
action tracks will look into consumer behavior and I you know again in Helena's presentation earlier I think we got a perfect partner here to work with. Um, there will be one action track on nature positive production for food and this is a very bold vision but something I think that's really achievable and you know I'm happy also here to connect to previous work um, done by FAO if I can just recall the analysis of the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement where we have seen a tremendous desire of countries to really work on food systems to live up to their Paris obligations, but often also a sense of a need of orientation, a need for technical support to actually be able to do that. <clears throat> and to do that in a way that would resonate with our fourth action track, which is building livelihoods and bringing the value chain more down on the ground to where people are, because you know, I think the word was used in the previous panel um, by the, the lady from the Philippines. It is ridiculous that those very people who are producing our food are the most food insecure and the poorest people on that planet. And the last action track, number five, is about the resilience to shocks. And designing that, we very much meant climate shocks, but we have seen with corona um, how a pandemic can really destabilize a global food systems. But we also want to look into conflict and political risk and also actual risk like the locust outbreak in East Africa. <clears throat> so we would like to have every one of you engaged. We will have five leads of our action tracks <clears throat> where we have really identified fantastic people that we will announce very, very soon, as soon as all five of them have said yes. But I can reassure you that these will be familiar names of people who are already taking leadership positions here. Um, and we would like to engage with all of you in these action tracks. But then let me briefly say um, what other instruments they are for being engaged. One is that we have a commitment to bring our spirit of the Food System Summit to every single country of the UN membership. That's a tall order, but we want to get engaged into discussions with all stakeholders in countries because food systems are local. And by all international connections we are having, we need to acknowledge and to see the different situations of food systems on the ground. And here's an opportunity because in addition to inviting you, of course, to be part of the food system dialogue in your own country, um, there's an opportunity to organize your own food systems dialogues because we will make all of our material downloadable and explicitly invite organizations and even individuals to hold multi-stakeholder conversations around food systems that can feed in into our summit process. <clears throat> Very soon you will see a champions network going live. And um, there's a reason why we call it the champions network, because we don't only have a limited number of people, high level people that would make the case for our summit. We also have those, but we ultimately want to reach out particularly to young people. We want to reach the YouTube influencer, the TikTok phenomenon. Um, people who are using a global media, social media to really reach out and connecting to their peers. And so we are looking into a champion network that hopefully will grow over time and help us really um, starting the global discussion that um, we want to see. There will be a scientific committee, which is already in place. First meeting will be on Monday. Um, which again plays to the multi-stakeholder nature of this summit. So one example, for example, is the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so a climate scientist will be on board, um, but many other experts um, from all over the planet. And we make a special effort to get all of the UN being part of that, the many UN organizations that we have and the resident coordinators um, on the ground. 
So let me finish by what we want to achieve. And I think there is a significant, of course, um, importance for food systems worldwide, but there's also a big significance for the UN at large. For the food systems, we really want to change the way people talk about food systems. We want that what we understand in places like um, this event is becoming common knowledge, that we look at food as a system and that governments look at food as something that deserves an all of government and truly an all of society approach. We want to come up with actions and we want to present game-changing actions which we are particularly looking towards the private sector to help us and I've seen already in discussions so far a tremendous readiness to really take responsibility for the externalities that some business models are causing and the desire to be not only money-making machines, but good corporate citizens, um, because there is an understanding that often leadership is lacking and <clears throat> that the world and the communities needs leaders for food systems. By the summit moment, as I already said, we want to come up with a set of simple principles which will not be negotiated, but still can be endorsed by as many people, governments, companies, NGOs, academia as possible. So we can put a polar star on the night sky as orientation for food systems. And last not least, come autumn next year, we don't want to drop our pens, but we want to have that as a beginning of a follow-up mechanism of holding ourselves responsible to the commitments we triggered with this summit and move forward. And let me conclude one last sentence about why I believe this matters for the UN. Because, you know, many people write about that the UN is in a crisis, that it's difficult, and most certainly these are not easy times for multilateral diplomacy. And to me, the only way to really um, inject new energy in the UN is to have an inclusive multilateralistic approach. And that simply means to talk and to include everyone who has a stake in our global um, system and for food systems. This is truly more than 7 billion people. That's a tall order, but I'm very grateful to events like this because we are building the energy to really transform our global food systems. Thank you very much and back to you, Beth. Thank you very much, Martin, for that very informative overview and status update on all of the hard work and planning that is going into the Food System Summit. I think it's very important for all of us to recognize the importance of one, bringing awareness to the food system itself and the transformation that is needed long term to, as you said, make sure that this is a very inclusive process. But also three, as we really do begin to think about the actions that will come from this important summit, that we do think about the importance of measuring and monitoring and holding all of ourselves accountable, whether that's by principle or by some other endorsed action statement. Uh, I think again, as we close out this particular session and the three days together in this dialogue, we all recognize the importance of that. But thank you very much for your hard work and for representing Ambassador Kalibata here today. We appreciate it. Our next and final speaker uh, is Amy Inaoka. Amy is the Deputy Director of the Global Health Policy Division in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. She has the role at the ministry to develop and coordinate Japan's global health policy. And I think again, very well known to this group as for the last probably couple of years, she has had the lead role in working towards the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit in collaboration with a number of different stakeholders. And Amy, we know that uh, there has been already many references to the Nutrition for Growth Summit. And so we're glad to have you here to close out this discussion and to provide more of an update on how plans for the summit are going and to talk a little bit more about how the Nutrition for Growth Summit can contribute and collaborate with private sector and business actions 
and also to tell us a little bit more about how you see private sector and businesses actually participating in the Nutrition for Growth commitments. Uh, we would very much welcome your reflections on that and look forward to your comment. Over to you. Thank you for your kind introduction, Beth. Let me first extend my appreciation to FAO, GAIN, and other people for organizing the, the round table and preparing useful uh, working papers. And also particularly for me to listen to insightful presentation and to meet uh, you, Rocco and Martin, virtually is uh, a good opportunity. And this is uh, for the business sector could step up the endeavor for a healthy diet and healthy planet. Um, the Japanese government uh, has been discussing with GAIN and other uh, various business people uh, how the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit could well reflect the business perspective and how the summit uh, could contribute to facilitate business actions. Uh, the Tokyo Summit, uh, which was unfortunately postponed one year, which is uh, December 2021 uh, due to the current uh, pandemic, but nevertheless, uh, improving world nutrition through the Tokyo Summit remains uh, Japan's priority. And we would like to uh, continue, continue to involve and facilitate business sector as business is crucial for healthy and sustainable food systems as it's laid out uh, three days uh, workshop. Let me briefly touch on the genesis of the N4G and Tokyo Summit. And N4G uh, has initiated by the UK government in connection with the Olympic and Paralympic game. And actually uh, today, at uh, 23rd of July, I should have, that, should have been the eve of the Tokyo Olympic game. Um, but, and also uh, we have planned kickoff event for Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit today, uh, but in vain, though uh, we have still deserve extraordinary national holiday for the Olympic game. But um, under the slogan of uh, human security, Japan has been contributing to human capital development and economic growth, and particularly paying attention to the basic human needs which definitely includes nutrition and food security. Uh, those who have visited Japan uh, might have surprised to see healthy and active aging people and aging society, and uh, which is definitely underpinned by Japan's uh, healthy diet. It is a result of what we eat and how we eat. So international academia has shown that uh, Japan's nutrition policy has been uh, through people-centered, multi-sectoral, and community-based uh, over the life course following the, the local context and has streamlined in the health system, agricultural planning, or food supply chain. So needless to say, this has been supported by a business and also consumers needs and awareness. So through this uh, Tokyo summit uh, endeavor, Japan has uh, got to know that healthy diet cannot be achieved only by policy measures and should be complementary action by all stakeholders who influence the supply and demand and environment around food production and consumption, which is obviously the business sector. So I would like to highlight that uh, this cannot be achieved by single stakeholders and needed synergy, uh, business, consumers, as well as policy makers. That's the reason why Japan has decided to host Tokyo Summit to involve all the various stakeholders to discuss first what each of the stakeholders could play their role uh, to the common goal and made their political and financial commitment uh, transparently. Japan is uh, currently considering the best path forward for the summit 
engaging with other uh, work streams, including uh, Food System Summit, Decade of Action, or others. So ensuring efficient and sustainable diet uh, for nutrition in all forms is even more urgent during uh, these challenging times. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with the, the focus of the Tokyo Summit, I just would like to uh, briefly touch on the, the, uh, the, the themes. Japan identified three core areas and, and two cross-cutting thematic areas and uh, laid it out effective key actions, which was compiled in a commitment making guide. The three core areas are uh, mainstreaming nutrition in health system and integrating nutrition into universal health coverage. The second is uh, building health system to health, healthy, environmentally sustainable and climate smart diet. And third is uh, promoting urgent and effective action in the, in the fragile and conflict affected uh, context. And the cross-cutting, two cross-cutting thematic areas are accountability and financing, which is ensuring monitoring and encouraging domestic and innovative financing. So you might be wondering how the business sector and individual companies uh, took leadership to join this endeavor. Please refer to commitment making guide, which uh, our thematic, international thematic working groups members has kindly compiled and provided guidance for the business sector to make a, a smart commitment. Uh, uh, actually, based on this guidebook, domestically uh, in Japan, Japanese Food Industry Group, NJPPP, is leading uh, the providing technical assistance to the domestic uh, 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 food industries, including SMEs, to review their company's policy and develop their own commitment. So as the Tokyo Summit, we plan to compile commitments from uh, stakeholders, including business, and we would like to various companies to register uh, their commitments. Of course, good com commitments vary, depends on the company size and uh, uh, the focus. But we are confident this uh, summit will increase the value of the, the companies as well as profit. After the corona, society will become more conscious to food system and responsible business. So lastly, I just uh, uh, mentioned that Tokyo Summit will provide an opportunity for business to present your uh, strategic or financial commitments as well as sharing the good, good practice and hand it over, and this would be handed over from the, the Food System Summit. Definitely, we should jointly uh, planning to connect uh, 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 each other. And then measuring the result uh, or showing evidence or performance is not always easy, particularly quant quantitatively, but the challenge to accountability is also the area that should be uh, invented, uh, we think. So uh, Japanese government will like to work with you to achieve a uh, universal, he universal healthy diet and sustainable uh, planet. So that's my uh, current uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Amy. It was uh, very helpful to get an update on it plans for the summit. So we know how much planning uh, has already been underway and know that despite disappointments for so many different events being postponed, that you continue to put great work into making sure that the summit is a success and that you bring together all of this important kind of collaboration. So we very much appreciate the detail and the hard work that is going into to the summit and look forward to contributing and participating in it with you. We have just just a few minutes left um, for some, some of your questions. Uh, I have a few from the chat that maybe I can direct to a couple of the, the different speakers. 
Martin, if you're still with us, I might offer one in particular to you. We had a question um, or an interest, I guess, perhaps uh, conveyed by one uh, participant asking you to elaborate on the national food systems dialogues and how specifically perhaps SMEs might participate in those. So perhaps a little bit more elaboration on the dialogues and the value of those. Thank you very much, happy to. <clears throat> Again, there are two different strands of country level dialogues. One is, I would basically say it's like push and pull communication. <clears throat> One is that we will actively with the help of a team go and address every government of this planet to host food systems dialogues that we want to have as multi-stakeholder dialogues. So we would publicize when these are taking place and we would actively encourage governments to invite SMEs and to, um, to have as broad a societal conversation about that. So in some countries, this will obviously be difficult because, you know, they are vast countries and very diverse countries. So we are opening a second opportunity, which is that people can actively download material. And there was a question in the chat I answered bilaterally. Um, this material will be available in the six UN languages. Um, we are, of course, very happy for both host governments and also people who take on to independently organize food system summits to translate into their respective language. Um, and so with these independently organized food systems dialogues, um, you have basically the possibility to bring that to your region, to your business association, to your city, to your, even to your university or to your college. Um, the whole point, of course, is that it's to an echo chamber, but an attempt is being made to really bring different stakeholders together, particularly when you feel, and this is something we hear very often, that in order to move forward, specific people are missing. Like this morning, we had a conversation about extension services, or better, the lack of extension services on the African continent. And it seems that there's a tremendous opportunity um, to work much more digitally on extension services. So who is missing on the table? It might be the big telecommunication companies that we need to pull in. And I think that's the kind of conversations we would really like to encourage, A, with government participation and carried by governments, but also really by individuals around the planet. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Rocco, I have a question for you that came in from one of our attendees and it has to do with this concept of accountability and recognizing that for many years now, private sector companies have reported, uh, whether it's to their investors uh, or to governments, about success that they might be having measurably uh, around their carbon footprint. Um, but yet we haven't quite made that transition to reporting, say, on perhaps dietary impact. And so again, back to ensuring this area of accountability, but making sure that we have the right kind of quantitative measurements uh, to ultimately get to that kind of progress uh, measurement is something that I think is a very interesting and obviously quite challenging uh, concept. Could you talk a little bit more, um, elaborate on some of your comments about the kinds of progress that you are as industry already beginning to make and how we might move more and more towards that dietary impact measurement. Thank you for the for the question, Beth. Um, I think first of all that we have um, in the area of nutrition probably quite a lot to learn uh, from the dynamics uh, and the solutions to an extent in climate change. Um, that said, it is also probably even trickier because it is less linear in the sense that if I, uh, if I measure accurately my carbon footprint, I can uh, draw a direct uh, correlation to uh, my impact or otherwise on, on climate change. Um, measuring, um, initi me measuring the outputs of, uh, of measures that I take on nutrition 
is much more complex um, and it depends on a number of variables. So for instance, if I reformulate a product, launch a new product, uh, whether that is successful, whether that has an impact or not, depends on the uptake of the product. It depends on um, substitution effects. It depends on the extent to which um, that product may be used in the diet of the consumer. It's sort of a banal example, um, but the, the dynamics um, are much more indirect between what one does and what the ultimate impact on public uh, health nutrition is because the public health nutrition outcome will be influenced by so many so many variables so i think we're a little bit in the infancy of actually having better quantitative outcome uh, measurements here um, I would nonetheless point to the work of the Access to Nutrition Index, which I think is the most comprehensive and, and, and robust uh, accountability mechanism that we have. It currently covers 20-something of the leading global food and non-alcoholic beverage companies. Um, they are looking also at extending potentially to retail and food service, uh, and they assess really a very broad um, number of indicators. They are not, I think, able yet either to, 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 to give you a, a very straight answer to this question, but the ranking that they produce is certainly helpful in, in, in seeing you know, what companies are doing best um, in, in this field. Uh, in addition to that, I, I understand that the World Benchmarking Alliance is also making quite good progress on a, on a new global index, which will look more broadly at um, a company's performance on a range of food systems indicators. So I think these are these are two areas to to highlight. Thank you. And maybe a question for Amy uh, around the uh, Nutrition for Growth Summit. Maybe two particular questions about how both SMEs can play a role and participate in the upcoming summit. And also, Amy, how you see innovation uh, as a part of the Nutrition for Growth Summit and how that might be covered uh, in the upcoming plans. Over to you. Thank you, Vess. Uh, would you please elaborate the second question, like innovation, innovation on? Just in a, how, how the space of innovation or as a thematic area, how that will be addressed in the uh, planning and the agenda of the summit itself. How innovation in food uh, products and technology, how is that being incorporated into the planning for the agenda of the summit? Uh, the first one is SME. Regarding SME, uh, definitely we are happy to have, I mean, SME, and we think, I mean, SME has a great uh, role to play uh, in worldwide, and so we would like uh, SMEs to participate at the summit, and also would like to, uh, we would like to provide the speaking thoughts to SME, and of course. Uh, uh, we are planning to compile all the, the commitments, including uh, uh, governments, uh, CSO, and business. So we are happy to include each individual SMEs or companies uh, commitment into this uh, compact, which is the, the annex of the, the, the outcome documents of the summit. And regarding the innovation, I mean, we think innovation is generally is quite important to, to solve uh, this our, our current uh, challenge, global challenge. And innovation should be in various uh, uh, folders, like we need uh, a policy innovation, we need innovation, and I mean technical innovation for, the, for improving the, the, the um, uh, nut nut nutrition, and also uh, supplies and other uh, various areas of the food system. So we would like to uh, highlight good innovation uh, in the uh, food summit, so that would be uh, di diffused globally. Hope I could uh, uh, reply to the, the question. Over. Thank you very much. Well, I think in the interest of time, we'll wrap it up here. But I just want to say to all three of you, thank you so much for all of the detail that you've been able to provide around your very uh, committed engagement and active uh, 
support in uh, putting together these very important upcoming events uh, that I think, again, follow on very nicely to the, to the work and the attention that's being brought to the topic of healthy and nutritious diets from even this very conversation. I just want to, I think, echo maybe Martin's comment to close, though, that while we all have our eyes on the calendar and are thinking about specific dates and specific venues and specific agendas, we all recognize that there will be much more work to be done following two very important events in 2021. Um, this particular panel was tasked with thinking about a very long-term horizon. We talked at the beginning about 10 years of looking out to see how we continue to make progress towards this. And I would encourage all of us in this conversation to, while we focus on the near term and these very important opportunities to continue to collaborate and bring more attention to food systems transformation and to the topics being covered here this week, that we never lose sight of the opportunity to continue to make very bold and very critical change uh, in these very important areas. So thank you for your foresight. Thank you for your commitment. And Steve, I'll turn it over to you to help us wrap up today and the three days of conversations. Thanks very much, Beth. I think that's great. Um... Uh, segue into our final session. You know, it's going to be a big lift and a long haul, those two things together. Um, Patrick, we asked you to make some final comments before Lawrence and, and Maximo sum up. Um, anything you've heard that kind of worries you we're not on the right track or things we should pay more attention to? What, what are your thoughts having framed this session and then listened to some of the, the inputs? Over to you. Thanks. And um, thank you to all the speakers and those involved, I, I think, you know, I'm really heartened, I think, on the positive side by convergence, convergence in thinking, approaches, language, getting the meetings to be linked, all of that is good. We're heading in the right direction. I would just say I will focus on accountability. I think we have to, we are all going to have to work together on how to better define and measure accountability. It can't just be accountability for commitments made at a summit and then following through, let's say, right? So I think accountability is going to have many dimensions. And I think that facet, of account those facets of accountability have yet to be fully fleshed out. And I just want to echo something Rocco was just saying about you know the challenge of measuring impacts on nutrition well I think one of the biggest challenges in terms of accounting for our actions is going to be determining the appropriate metrics and levels of of multipliers externalities for example right so if if it if it is easy to measure carbon footprint and, and as an externality to let's say producing a certain kind of food, there are equ equivalent health externalities and nutrition externalities from uh, certain diets that include or do not include certain foods. So I think we have to go very quickly beyond the idea of individual nutrients or individual food products and individual consumer outcomes to population-wide outcomes. And the accountability framework has therefore to, to be granular and flexible enough to embrace that kind of thinking right that whatever we produce process move sell and consume has impacts both on planetary health and on human health and accountability frameworks are going to need to be able to attach to that grand agenda otherwise we fail the, the, the systemic issues are so large um, but they are not so large and complex that we can't better understand externalities, how prices of food need to accommodate those externalities, and how choices by better informed consumers can help change those externalities. But I think that's a big agenda. It's something that both of the summits need to pay attention to, and we all need to work together on it. Thanks. over to Maximo and Lawrence to sum 
and close our meeting. Maxima, I think you're going to go first. I'll leave you together in the chair to uh, make your final comments and then close the meeting on behalf of us uh, all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, uh, and, and thank you all for, for this uh, meeting. Um, so we have come to the end of this dialogue. So everyone around the table, private sector and healthy diets. And over the last three days, uh, a wealth of knowledge and ideas have been shared. Uh, certainly, we have achieved the objective we set for these dialogues to discuss and identify how and what business can do to provide consumers with healthy diets to discuss how the enabling policy environment can be created and incentives put in place for the delivery of healthy diets, and to place the private sector, uh, micro, and small and medium enterprises in the particular at the center of the discussion, and to provide recommendations for food system transformation that can lead to this healthy diet needed. We have global opportunities coming up through the Nutrition and Global uh, Growth Summit and also through the Food System Summit, all in 2012. But again, it's important to note that these are events and we need a, a huge process of transformation that will go farther than those events and these events are supposed to create a seat to be able to move forward. The expected outcomes of this event uh, frame commitments from, from the private sector and a full report and synthesis recommendations will be issued by FAO and GAIN. And I won't repeat the details of the summaries provided already by Marcella uh, on days one and two and you will see this later. Let us remember the importance of what we have learned from the SOFI statistics. There are 3 billion people that cannot afford healthy diets. 3 billion. In 2030, we have 9 billion people. So it's a third of our future population that today cannot access healthy diets. And that's a huge challenge. Uh, these two things, uh, the importance of, of the, the lack of access and also the current situation of undernourishment, which is completely out of track, by 2030, SDG2, uh, requires a change and requires a pretty important change, a drastic change. I don't see this, of course we need uh, goodwill on all the stakeholders, but we need more than just goodwill. I think we need to act and we need to change and we need to align incentives. And this is extremely uh, important. And as it was stated by the Director General, the private sector from farmers to micro and small medium enterprises and larger companies is at the heart of the food systems. All farmers are private sector at the end of the line. And all the value chain is composed by private sector. Government plays a role to enable the environment, but all of them are there. So governments have a key act to play and that's central and everybody was clear across the meeting of the importance of the role of the government. But they can enable the environment, they can facilitate the process, they can help with the regulatory systems that are need to be in place, like for example, with informing consumers and putting mechanisms of regulation that Chile has done, for example, with the label mechanism and other countries are starting to do. They can also promote uh, through different mechanisms, the production systems and the farmers so that they can start to deliver what is supposed to happen to be able to achieve the goal of access of healthy diets by, uh, as it was stated in the SDG2. So they have that role uh, and there are many tools that they can use. We argue in the SOFI that one of the tools they can use in addition to enabling the environment is of course align the incentives. Most of the support today goes to starchy foods, to staple commodities. That can change, that can move to other types of commodities which are more important for a, a good healthy diet and can allow to increase the levels of productions that are needed in those, in those sectors, which today are not there. They can also facilitate intra-regional trade in, within country trade and, and global trade, which is also important. The, the argument that we should produce all ourselves doesn't work because many countries cannot do it for sure because they don't have the conditions. Second, if a choke happens to my country, what I do? So it's crucial, trade plays a crucial role, but it has to have the correct incentives. And that shouldn't be a deteriorate uh, against local producers. On the contrary, local producers will have access to bigger markets and we need to think in that way because what we want is to expand markets. And today we are not even expanding markets at the intra-regional intra level. So governments has a huge role to play, but also the private sector has a huge role to play and they are a huge part of, of, of the food systems. Data is also central and we are trying to bring as much data in place and GAIN is also trying to bring as much data in place to make proper decisions. We have been collaborating with GAIN and with many other stakeholders to do that. And the SOFI, I believe, is trying to do that. But let me finish by, by, by saying something that I, I don't know uh, people will like or not. But I think we are still living in a denial. I don't know what else we need to show. 
So we are telling the world that we are completely off track to achieve SDG2 in terms of undernourishment. By 2030, we will have 840 people undernourished, 840 million people undernourished. We have 2 billion people that cannot access to all the, all the food in, in the quantities and in, in, the, in the consistency they need. And we have 3 billion people that cannot access to healthy diets. The problem is worse in the poorest countries, in Africa, in protected crisis countries, in South Asia. So the evidence is there. Of course, we can bring more evidence into the game, and that's our effort. But we need to change. And, and to change is important because the incentives today are not clear. We are talking about food systems. Now, if I don't look at the hidden costs, we call the trade-offs of the food systems that come from soil, water, emissions, biodiversity, what are we talking about? If I don't know the size and the magnitude of the hidden costs in each of the commodities we produce, what are we talking about? What, what change we want? If I don't know how much NCDs, non-communicable diseases, the current energy-based data, the diets are generating, then what are we talking about? And we brought evidence to that this year. We are showing the amount that using the diets that we're using today, which are mostly energy-based diets, will create $1.3 trillion more in health costs and will create per year until 2030, $1.7 trillion more in emissions. And we have shown that access to healthy diets and, and moving towards healthy diets could reduce that significantly. More than 90% in the case of the health costs and between 35 to 40 something percent in the case of emissions. So let's start to measure and bring in those hidden costs and people understand what is happening because any achievement of SDU Two will have hidden costs. And that will trans make transparent the process so that also the producers or the MSMEs and the medium enterprises in the agricultural system will also get the benefits of that, of how they are minimizing and taking care of those hidden costs. So we need to understand them properly to be able to get the change and to be able to do the change we need to do. Also, we need not to confuse public versus private goods. Environment is a public good. My food, my healthy diet is a private good. I cannot charge the consumer for the public good cost. Of course, I can move the consumer and change their behavior so that they are more responsible, socially more responsible in a sustainable way. But I cannot make the consumer pay the cost of other industries or other sectors which have created that situation that we're living today. We need to find ways at the global or at the regional level to also support that process so that we can achieve the goals. Some countries will need to produce more emissions to be able to get the micronutrients and the healthy diets they need. Other countries are already over consuming emissions, which they don't need to do and they need to reduce, but we need to balance this at the global level. That's aligning the incentives. That's the change that we need. And the information is already there. Now, how we can facilitate the process with the private sector, we have talked about blending, PPPs, but the core of this is market opportunities. And there are significant market opportunities if we are able to align properly the incentives. So my point is we need to do the change, but we need to clearly do the change. Uh, and we need to stop not thinking of the reality because the reality that we have today requires a significant change. So with that, uh, I would like to stop. I would like to thank all of you for, for this great participation. Thank the FAO team, the Nutrition Division, and, and the GAIN team for all the effort they have done, and all of you for participating in that. And let me, with that, pass to Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Maximo. Um, a really stirring uh, call to action. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's left to me to make a few. Um, I'm standing between you and leaving this meeting, so I'll be brief. I think we've got some great ideas and propositions that we will take forward and feed into the at least the two summits that we're we're actively engaged with, and uh, and and indeed as Beth reminds us way beyond the two summits. This is a ten-year program to 2030. We've heard about what governments need to do. Um, they're in charge, very you know, in in many ways of the initial settings of our food systems. The, the price incentives, the internalization of externalities, 
um, the public uh, procurement, the, all sorts of, they've got, they've got so many levers they can pull. Uh, the question is which ones to pull first and pull hardest. Uh, and I think that's where a national food system action plan is, can really, really be helpful. Plans themselves are neither here or there, but the production of the plan and the, the joint learning around them and the realization of what's really important and what's really urgent, uh, that's the value add. As for business, um, you know, you heard Emmy and uh, Martin both say business has a really important role to play in both of these summits that are coming up. But I refer to you to my comments on day one of this meeting, please don't lump all businesses together. There are, remember the eight cells in the, in the table, the two by four table I mentioned to you on day one, uh, big transnationals, medium size, small and micro and many farmers are in the smaller micro, and that's in the food column. And in the non-food column, there are many other players that are really important. And Martin mentioned um, the internet providers, really, really important. So there are eight cells, business is not a monolith, it's a collection of groups. And even within each of those cells, there's incredible variation. And even within individual companies, there's incredible variation. So my plea is to be nuanced. Embrace the gray, don't just think of black and whites here. Um, I thought Rocco's, Rocco gave us a great example of how big businesses can come together in, net, in networks to, to formulate with civil society a responsible business pledge, which has general principles, but then some very specific things in the, in, in the pledge that can be and will be monitored by uh, a, a framework um, supported by ATNI and others. On business still, how do we incorporate SMEs into this process? We, we keep saying they're really important, but unless they collectivize uh, or we find a, a way of amplifying their voice, they're going to get drowned out. Um, so we heard about the food systems dialogues, um, one planned for every country on the planet. That's good. Uh, the Sun Business Network is a, is a dedicated network of a thousand SMEs. They are feeding in uh, quite explicitly into the Nutrition for Growth uh, work. But there will, be, there, will be, there will be other ways of doing that, and we need to look for other platforms. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things that's come out over and over again is that food system transformation is just too big for any one organization any one sector and any one type of stakeholder. We all need to come together. Coming together is easy to say, it's difficult to do. It requires common goals, uh, as Maximo said, aligned incentives. It requires smart commitments, as Rocco said, and it requires strong accountability. Uh, and not just the accountability of, as Patrick quite rightly said, uh, not just the accountability of saying, you said you were gonna do this at a summit, did you do it? That is really important because if you don't do that, that can undermine uh, broader trust. But also this, you know, we must account for the impacts of our actions on the environment and on health. And that's a really massive challenge because it's a massive technical challenge and it's a massive political economy challenge. But it's a challenge that must be, uh, must be faced. And then we finally, we talked about trust, you know, uh, how do we, different players coming to the table with competing interests, perhaps? Um, how can we align the interests? Uh, well, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to be, if you're going to build trust, you have to be open to, to building it in the first place. And I think the vast majority of people in our space are open to that uh, building of trust. There are some who, you know, think that the business is the devil and should never be included into this space but I don't know how you can hold that concept with the other concept of most people buy their food from markets and therefore they engage with, with business in one way or another. Um, it's very important that we just focus, we focus on actions, not just words. It's very important that we focus on promises kept and also promises mirrored. You know, businesses might make commitments, but governments also need to make commitments to enable the synergy to happen. They both have to keep their promises and trust can be built. And it, it must be built because I said at the beginning of, of, the, of the week, uh, we're in a time of change right now. 
um, massive trillion dollar bailouts. Um, the pace of digitization is spellbinding and dizzying. And, you know, statues being toppled, uh, symbolic, but, but nevertheless symbolic of profound shifts in values and an underlying uh, change. So, my friends, uh, we're in a time of change. And as Maximo said, we must change the times and we must do that together. Um, and before I close, let me just, let me just uh, do a call out to a few people in particular on behalf of Maximo and myself. I, I would really like to thank Patrick for his presentation today. It was really thoughtful, both at the beginning and the end. Thank you, Patrick. I'd like to thank all the presenters and all the panelists for today and, and indeed the more than 40 speakers who have presented over the last three days. I'd like to thank all of you who have dialed in, uh, some of you for all three days, some of you dipped in and out, but really, uh, especially those who made some active contributions to the chat box. I thought, I thought you were um, um, provocative, but responsible and constructive. Uh, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, special thanks to uh, two colleagues, one, uh, Lara uh, Mashuana at FAO and Candela Fito at GAIN. Uh, and these two uh, special people anchored the arrangements and planning for this meeting. And, uh, and I would like to also thank many, many colleagues in both organizations who have made it happen, especially Steve Godfrey and uh, Marcella uh, Villarreal. So on behalf of FAO and for GAIN, uh, Maximo, I think I can do that. Let me thank you for joining this week, and we look forward to working with you uh, over the next 12 months on this really important, indivisible set of agendas uh, and way beyond the next 12 months. So thank you. Steve, back to you. Uh, my task is simply to say goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maximo and colleagues. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.